Hey, this is Joe Gilder from Persona. <laughs> okay. So now that I work for Personas, I'm doing videos for them and videos for Home Studio Corner, and it is a struggle to start my videos now. Hey, this is Joe Gilder from Home Studio Corner. Hey, this is Joe Gilder from Personas. And then I was at Sweetwater last week doing a video. Hey, this is Joe Gilder at Personas at Sweetwater. Anyway, <laughs> just it's first world problems. Hi, I'm Joe Gilder. You're watching a video. Glad you're here. Uh, last week here on Home Studio Corner, we talked about choosing the right EQ. And, and I showed you how I tend to go about thinking about using a regular stock parametric EQ versus using something with a more analog feel. And for me, uh, you can watch the whole video, but for me, it's almost more about function over tone. Um, it's more about this one gives me certain abilities to do certain things versus this one. But there is an element of tone to the choices as well. Somebody commented and said, all EQs sound the same. Yeah. I understand the, th the thought process behind it, right? All EQs essentially do the same thing, meaning they boost and cut frequencies. I'm cool with that. But saying all EQs sound the same is kind of like saying the only purpose for having a guitar amp is to amplify the signal and make it louder. But unless you're playing like a Fender Twin, that's not really the case, right? Amps, are, they do make the guitar signal louder, but they also impart all kinds of tone. And originally, this is what's fun, guitar amps weren't supposed to be all crunchy and distorted originally. It was just that the only technology we had was tubes, and they wanted to make it louder, and doggone it, those tubes weren't super clean for amplifying things clearly. So when you got louder, it got crunchier, and that became, like, that became the guitar amps we have today. I think that's fascinating. And if I'm wrong there, just forget it. Don't You don't have to tell me I'm wrong. But I think that was something about how guitar amp tone started. Wow, I'm off track. So today I want to talk about compressors as well um, and how I go about choosing which compressor I'm going to use. Some of that's based on tone. A lot of that, again, is based on some of the, the, the features of a particular compressor, what it will and won't do. So my point in talking about guitar amps and all that is there is definitely tone there to using like an analog style EQ versus a standard one or uh, an, an EQ or a compressor that's modeled off of a famous hardware compressor and not. Will Are you able to get good mixes using just stock EQs and compressors, just plain Jane, run of the mill, regular old non-analog style compressors and EQs? Absolutely. I've done it for years. Most of the music in my library, if you search for my name, Joe Gilder, in Spotify, a lot of the music you hear there was mixed just using stock EQs and compressors. So you absolutely can get good results there. However, there's a reason that all these other plugins exist. There's a reason that people did all over the world don't just use the same EQ and compressor all the time. Now, is some of that just humans being subjective and like I bought this $4,000 compressor ergo it sounds amazing because if it doesn't sound amazing I'm going to be really sad about losing four grand yeah that's a that's going to be a part of it but there's also there are sonic differences the comment I made back to the person who was talking about how EQs are all the same is the EQ that I was using the passive or the 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 vintage EQ in studio one on the fat channel it has this kind of saturation sound that comes in especially when you start boosting frequencies quite a bit so when I boost the mids or the lows on something, it gets a little, just a tiny bit crunchy. That doesn't happen on the standard Pro EQ. It just boosts it cleanly with no alteration in sound. That's a feature, you know? It's, it's, it is neither good nor bad, but it is different and it does sound different. Same holds true to the same extent, if not more, with compressors. So let's dive into Studio One and I'll show you the stock compressor in Studio One, which is called, get this, compressor. And then uh, we'll, I'll show you a couple of different analog models. And it doesn't matter what plugins you use, whether you use the ones that come in Studio One, if you've got the UAD stuff, if you've got Wave stuff, if you've got some other brand, uh, it, it, they're, all, they're all doing a good job. Um, but the focus of today, and I'm sorry, I'm talking so much, I'm just kind of uh, amped up. I've had a lot of coffee. Focus of today is to show you my thought process of when I'm choosing those analog compressors and why. So hopefully help you to think through your choices and, and ultimately help you make those choices quicker so you can keep mixing and get 
get back to making music and putting things out and not sitting there clicking through a thousand compressors at a time. Okay? All right, let's dive in. All right, here's some drum tracks from my song Whitewash, and let's take a listen. Okay, kind of halfway mix. The individual tracks have some stuff. I've taken off any plugins on the drum bus itself because that's where we're going to play today. So I'm going to bring in two plugins onto this drum bus. The first being the regular compressor plugin, just the stock compressor inside of Studio One. The second being the fat channel, which I'm going to make it look a little simpler so we can just see what's there. Okay, so okay. Let's start off with the regular compressor plugin. What's great about stock compressors like this is you have all the controls that you expect from a compressor. We can adjust the attack time. We can adjust the release time. We can adjust input gain. That's that's not as common. Uh, ratio, threshold, even the knee control. Now, this isn't a tutorial on how to use compressors. I've got those. You can check those out. But here's how I would set something like this up. Generally speaking, I'd probably go with a slower attack time with a fairly quick release on drums. Um, slower attack time so that we can let some of that punchiness of the drums come through. So it might sound something like, let's go like four to one, let's dial in a sound here. Kick drum got a little more punchy in your face, snare drums triggering, triggering it. Sounds pretty good, sounds great, great. Cool, let's do that, that's awesome. Now, this gives me surgical control over everything, much like the EQ does. We switch over to the fat channel and to compressors like this, what do we notice? First of all, if you're gonna use compressors like this, and I recommend exploring with them, I went for a long time without using them and then realized, shoot, these, these are actually really cool, I've, I've been missing out. But one thing to keep in mind is you gotta pay attention to the control. So, for example, this compressor here, I like this one on drums. What do you notice about the knobs here? First thing I notice, well, not first thing, but soon after starting to use it, I realize this one doesn't have an attack setting. It only has this recovery, which is kind of like a release setting, um, but there is no attack setting. So then I started listening to how this compressor works, and it sounds like it has a very fast attack time. And that's not bad, it's just different. It means if I go really heavy with the compression here, it's gonna sound differently than this compressor, which has the nice slow attack time. Okay, so let's just dial this one in so you can hear the difference. Let me click it on and here we go. Okay, again, not bad, it's kind of doing some cool stuff, but it is different and it's, it's hitting that kick drum immediately. So some of that thump thump of the kick drum isn't quite coming through as much because the whole thing is being hit more. So when I use this particular compressor on drums, I try to ease it back so I'm not doing a ton of compression because too much compression with that faster attack sounds like over compression. Another thing to keep in mind, if you have a compressor that looks something like this, which is modeled after like an 1176-ish circuit. Um, one of the things to note, and I didn't realize this until using this specific one that Personas makes, look at the attack time here. This is the fast attack time, this is the slow attack time. On the original box, like if you had one of these actual analog things, it just goes from one to 10. And so you really have no clue what is one, what is 10, what are these attack times. But according to this, if this is accurate and it sounds to my ear like it is, then the fast attack time is 0 0.02 milliseconds. And the, quote, slow attack time is 0.8 milliseconds. What does that mean? That means the attack time, no matter where you set this, is under a millisecond. Over here, we had the attack time set to 40 milliseconds. Now, I know we're talking milliseconds, but in terms of a drum, uh, drum hit, 40 milliseconds is a long time and can really change the sound of the compression that's happening. Let me show you. Let's go back to this compressor. I'll just bring the attack time down as we listen. Two things are gonna happen. You're gonna hear the change to the front end of the kick and snare drum, but you're also gonna see that there's more compression happening because of the faster attack. So just take a listen to what happens when I bring this attack down to, for example, one millisecond. So 
So th- th- this isn't like my final setting for compressing the drums. There's a lot of pumping. The cymbals sound wonky. But in general, it demonstrates that idea. The drums got quieter because there was more compression, but they also got a lot less punchy. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just different. Um, for a while there, honestly, if you've been following me for a while, there was a good season there where I told I was telling everybody just use s- slow attack times always. And sometimes that's good, and the theory behind it makes sense, and it does work sometimes. But sometimes these faster attack compressors, combined with the fact that they are modeled off of analog circuitry that just has a certain mojo to it, can sound really good. So let's take that same drum track, run it through here, where we know, no matter where we put this, it's going to be a slow attack time, or it's going to be a fast attack time. And let's just see kind of what kind of tones we get by running it through this compressor. Now this one behaves where we turn up the input and have to turn down the output. That's kind of the way this thing works. Okay, let's dial something in. So we can hear the compression, it's happening, but it's interesting to me. So this fast attack compression to me just sounds a little bit better than the one over here. The one over here felt a little more surgical and not as vo- as vibey. Let's listen to it. similar sound, but this one to me sounded a little more surgical, like it sounded a little more nerdy. (laughs) That's the only way I can say it. Whereas this one, now there's never going to be a perfect A-B comparison, but this one to me has just a more interesting vibe to it with roughly the same amount of compression. The attack of that snare drum And that kick drum especially is, there's not as much punch there, but there's also something about the way this compressor works that it keeps the low end there. And the low end kind of comes through, so it still feels big and thick. That's that's the kind of thing I'm looking for when I'm using these compressors. Um, Another option is if I want an analog sort of sounding compressor, but I want more control, I'll use this one. This one, as you can see, has all the controls I want. It has attack and release. Again, I don't know how fast and slow these are, but they feel a lot more like what I would expect from a fast and a slow attack and release setting. Um, And I can get a pretty good sound out of this as well. Something about the way that interacts and the way the cymbals sound on that compression sounds to me, to my ears, better than what I'm getting over here. Let's go to that cymbal, that fill here. That's a little aggressive, but you get the idea. Let's listen to that again. This is just a brighter sounding compressor. That's what I've over the, I've used this for years and years and years. It just has a brighter sound to it. This compressor just doesn't. Helps if you turn it on. Durga, durga, durga. The cymbals aren't dark and muddy, but they just, they don't come crashing through and like slicing your eardrum quite like the other one. Now, I'm not bashing the stock compressor in Studio One. It has lots of great uses, especially because I can get really fast with the attack and release, really surgical. I I like to use it a lot for things that I want to do more volume control um, versus like tone control. And that comes back to what we were saying earlier in this video and in the last video. Some of it is a tone thing. I like the tone of this compressor for drums specifically, more than I like the tone of this one with the same and similar settings. They both have a place, um, just like you'd be hard pressed to find an electric guitar player who only plays one electric guitar. Chances are he or she has a collection of at least a handful, humbuckers, single coils, Les Paul, Strat, that kind of thing, to give them different tones. It's the same way in the studio. Can you get by and make a full record using one guitar or one compressor? 
Absolutely. Are there others out there that can give you other tones? Yep, absolutely. That's true as well. This is a longer video. Thank you for sticking around to the end. Uh, this is the kind of stuff I love talking about. Hopefully this gave you some ideas and things to try on your mixes. And thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see here and you want to learn more about my mixing process and you haven't checked out my five-step mix guide, you need to check that out. Go to fivestepmix.com. It's 100% free, except you have to give me your email address, but then I'll email you and we can be friends. How's that sound? Good? Good. All right. See you in the next one.